Hello. Um, uh, OK, why are we here again? <laughs> I think I remember. We're going to talk about health again. And today we're going to talk about, we're going to move beyond our simple SIR infections to expand a little bit more in uh, different directions, and in particular to think about how pathogens evolve. OK? So um, the things that we, of course, we're a little bit self-centered. And so when we think about pathogen evolution, hmm? is there an on switch? Oh, I see. No. Uh, oh, it's beginning to see this one. One moment, sorry. Here we go. So what we care about is pathogens that evolve to be more transmissible or infectious, so they spread more quickly through populations. We care about pathogens that learn to escape our immunity, because that means, or evolve to escape our immunity, because that means we get infected over and over again. We care, of course, if they evolve to kill us more, to be more virulent. Um, and we care if they develop resistance to the therapeutics that we have. I'm really struck by the fact I keep using the words like learn and develop, where what I'm talking about is evolution. <laughs> One of my um, mentors wrote a paper about how doctors refer to evolution, and they always use anything other than the word evolution, because many doctors don't necessarily believe in evolution. But uh, when I say all these stupid things, hear evolution, please. <laughs> OK. And so what we're going to you know, and the, what we're going to talk about today is uh, mostly these three, but we'll touch on the fourth. If we start with our classic SIR model, and we imagine uh, the ways in which I've just discussed pathogens could evolve, what they could be doing is increasing transmission. This is the beta term. They could be making the virulence worse. So this is increasing how much, say, for example, mortality takes you out of the infected box. They could be making the infectious period longer, so it might take you or longer in order to recover, or they could be escaping from immunity. So I'm going to ask you, do these, are these likely to increase the fitness of the pathogen? Will any of these, so we as, as human beings on this planet care about when pathogens evolve these four features. Transmission is a problem because if you remember, when SARS-CoV-2 evolved the alpha variant, it started spreading through populations much more quickly. And that just meant that hospitals were overwhelmed in a problematic fashion. It makes it harder for us to control them. Virulence is obviously a problem. Things that kill us more or hurt us more are things we care about. Uh, the infectious period matters because this also shapes how fast the things are moving. And then immune escape will mean that we have it over and over again. So I'm telling you, these are the things that worry us, ways in which the pathogens we have could change. And I'm asking you, are these things good ideas? Good ideas. Are these things likely to increase the fitness of the pathogen? Are these things likely to be selected for in pathogen populations? All of them? No, no, no. <laughs> yes. Like Ebola. Perfect. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? And these two also could increase fitness. And we can see it by looking at the, uh, what R0 is, right? Beta increases fitness. Mu i, if anything, reduces it. Makes sense. So how, when, well, let's start by thinking a little bit about immune escape, and then we'll move into thinking about increased virulence. We could draw a pattern for immune escape that looks like this. So individuals are moving into the recovered box and then going back to the birth box. So what the, would that look like? Usual terms.
feel like the chorus is speaking to me. <laughs> yes? Anything missing? It's possible. Vaccination. I think we do. Right. So that's the things flowing in. Okay. And so di dt is going to be these guys, right? Into yes. si minus mu i minus mi. Exactly. Uh, let me check my notes. <laughs> but I think that's exactly right. Okay, and then, as you probably remember, we're working in a world where everything's at equilibrium. So we can simplify things. We can ignore these guys, because it's, it's the sum of the other two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here n minus s minus i, right? Does that make sense to everybody? OK. OK. And so if we want to figure out what's going on, it must be probably obvious to you guys that r naught has not changed, right? The number of new infections per infectious individual in a completely susceptible population is the same. It's these inflows and these outflows from the infected box. Yeah? So what has changed is how the susceptibles are being replenished. And as always, if we want to get to grips with this, uh, what we would probably start by doing is put DSDT to equilibrium, right? To, to, to zero, which means that the, the thing is at equilibrium. OK? So I'm going to write it down and then Someone's going to tell me what to do. Yeah? So this would be if this is at equilibrium. And usually what we want to do at this stage, as you may remember, as you may be bored of remembering, is to set i on one side of the equation, right? So we want. Let's break it all down first. Let's do n mu minus p n mu minus mu s minus beta s i plus delta n minus delta s minus delta i equals zero. So terms we have in i are these guys, right? So we're going to say delta i, well, let's do beta s plus delta i equals, take these out, n mu minus p n mu minus mu s plus delta, is that a delta? That isn't delta. n minus, did something go wrong? My handwriting is terrible. <laughs> it's very hard to see what's happening. Uh, so nu minus p n mu minus mu s minus beta si plus delta n minus, this should be s. delta s. Yes. Minus delta s equals, equals yes. Correct? Good. So we have an expression for i by dividing it through the other side. Someone want to tell me what that is because I can't read over there? <laughs> n mu Good. 
OK. And then we can probably collect some terms, right? So let's do n. Uh, should we do n mu? Hang on. Yeah. Correct? Yes, no? <laughs> Correct, but at a very strange angle. <laughs> um, OK, and so as ever, uh, let us say, for example, we want to know what the proportion we need to vaccinate is. Is there a problem? There might be a problem. Yes. It's very likely. So this is mu s minus delta s, right? Those two? I admit my handwriting is a disaster. <laughs> it could be a mistake as well. No? OK. And this is n mu plus n delta. So that's here. And then this guy I've kept out for reasons that will be obvious in a moment. Ah, OK. <laughs> a remote. Oh, I see. Ah, OK. Let me know. OK. OK. Um, so now if we ask ourselves, what does it take? How much do we need to vaccinate to set to drive infection to zero, right? So we, we have infection, it's at equilibrium here. So obviously, that's going to be this relationship equal to zero. Um, and so we only need to worry about the top here. That's saying, and I'm going to do a shortcut and move this guy over to the left, right? So it's going to say P n mu equals n mu plus delta minus s mu plus delta. So in fact, we can do mu plus delta times n minus s. Is that all the bits? That's all the bits, right? So p equals mu plus delta times n minus s divided by n mu. And we showed last time, as you may remember, that s is the inverse of R naught, right? So if n equals 1, we can, whoops, that is, that is just terrible. <laughs> Forgive me. Let's do that again. <laughs> Still not great. n times mu, right? And so we can, what we could do is divide this by n. So we're going to have n over n is 1, s over n we're assuming that n is 1. S over n is going to be 1 over R0. Over R0. That term and it's going to be multiplied by mu plus delta divided by mu. Catastrophic handwriting, but uh, I think this is the correct answer. Does this ring any bells? I might write it out again so that it's more obvious. So we now have a new condition for that critical proportion to vaccinate in order to guarantee that the infection goes extinct. And that's 1 minus 1 over R0 times mu plus delta over mu. Does this remind anyone of anything? <laughs> that way. I'm asking you a question, not the other way around. <laughs> Does this look familiar? Yeah. 
Your expressions all suggest you know exactly what the answer is, but you're not going to tell me. <laughs> ah, interesting. That is not where I was going and not what I expected. From the first lecture on the SIR, we also estimated what the proportion we'd need to vaccinate in order to drive the infection to zero. Yeah? This rings a big bell. And that was equal to this. And what we've done today is we've said, same basic idea, except there is also waning of immunity. So you move from the R to the S box. And what that tells us is that you need to vaccinate this much more, right? Which is a number that's going to be bigger than one, obviously, from the way it's defined. So this relationship tells you how much harder you have to work to eliminate an infection if there is waning of immunity. Something we care about, obviously, because many, many things wane. OK, if I go back to this, is that person denied? Does that work? So this you just have in the same way on the slides. And in fact, I can put some of these things down. So R0 and S will be the same, but the susceptibles are being replenished faster. And we can work through the maths to get to that critical proportion vaccinated. I just did it, and you have it here. Uh, so the take home message is that we have to work extremely hard to increase in order to eliminate something where even there's a little bit of waning. And um, you can work through and figure out what that cr critical proportion would be for some classic r noughts and you get these curves of just absolutely accelerating vaccination coverage. So, the, uh, so you know, immune escape obviously will be a problem in a similar way, but anything where you have um, more susceptibles pouring in, higher birth rates, all these things make the spread of such infections hard to control. Let us now turn to evolution of increased virulence, which, as you so nicely pointed out, is not something that we would expect to happen ordinarily because it only reduces the fitness of the pathogens. The reason that it might happen is if more virulent pathogens reach higher levels of transmission. So perhaps there's more of them in the lungs, right? So perhaps beta and that mu i are somehow correlated. And we'd expect that, you know, on the one hand, more virulent pathogens might spread more, but they also have the effect of, like, you know, reducing the amount of time you're moving through populations and transmitting. So they could actually, at some scale, decrease transmission indirectly by removing you from the population. So we expect there to be negative selection beyond a certain degree of virulence. There's going to be some balance between the two extremes. Uh, because we were in the class we're in, we're obviously going to put some maths on that. If we imagine that virulence goes up with transmission rates, this would be some beta. What we're saying is that as virulence goes up, transmission time goes down. So how long transmission is happening goes down. And that therefore, somewhere in the middle, there's going to be an optimal. We can get at this. We can show this using mathematic. If we express transmission as some function of virulence, so I'm going to call virulence the extra mortality suffered by infected individuals. So my expression for R0, some expression for fitness, capturing how fast these things are spreading through populations, might look like this. It's the usual things flowing into the infected box divided by things flowing out of the infected box. And these are the usual parameters, but now I've added one extra, which is how much more infected individuals are dying. Um, and so the relationship looks like this. We get something that curves in this way. And you, as you would expect, the combination of those two, this relationship, I th I'm sure you can see, is going to be some sort of curvy thing. How would we find the virulence mapping to maximum fitness? Exactly. So we get uh, dr naught over d alpha. Pretty straightforward. Set it to zero. This makes sense to everybody? Yes then you get the optimal virulence is equal to something right there. And it increases with the mortality of the two, and it'll be a function of these two other parameters. Uh, yes, was there an error in that? No. OK. <laughs> if, if there's an error, I, I didn't catch. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
thank you for your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what could be the reasoning behind assuming this relation between transmission and virulence? It's a really interesting question. So the, um, uh, I was going to come to this quote later. Uh, one of my favorite epidemiologists, Mark Lipsitch, once said that this, this area of epidemiology has the highest ratio of theory to data in the entire field. <laughs> People love making stuff up about this, right? Because it gives you these cool, funky relationships. The empirical evidence for these sorts of relationships is hard to get at. But you can imagine, I mean, it is possible to imagine that if uh, it is a, a lung pathogen, for example, then the more there is of the virus in my lungs, the more I spew out, the greater the transmission, but also the closer I am to dying. So you, you can sort of imagine there might be this sort of relationship. Is that the question you're asking? I'm uh, asking more precisely about beta equals to... C okay, C yeah, so, so again, so it would need to be, um, if it's not a saturating relationship, then you just evolve towards hypervirulence. So there's something artificial about what I've chosen there. I don't think we know, I don't think this thing has been well parameterized in any system apart from one I will describe. So these were ch this was chosen entirely con for convenience. It derives nicely. <laughs> so it's an excellent question uh, with, a, with a complete nonsense answer. <laughs> yeah? But very good question. There's a whole, uh, there's a vast amount of literature that tries to probe uh, what empirical evidence there is and what that shape of this relationship might be. And the general conclusion, the conclusion has been, it might look like this, but we just can't measure it. It's very hard to measure it. Or the conclusion has been, what are you all doing? This is just nonsense. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, another way in which uh, it's, um, I think, very intriguing to think about evolutionary strategies is to consider the fact that the strategy employed by other individuals in the population might affect the success of your strategy, right? So how would you, so does anyone know how this might be termed and, and one of the ways you might explore it? Uh, so, so, if, if, so in this situation, it doesn't matter what anyone else in the population is doing, right? I am my own virulent strategy, and I invade, I'm a pathogen, obviously. I invade, and as long as I'm doing this strategy, I win. But if you imagine I'm in a, I'm in a world where every other pathogen is extremely mild, for example, is that different for the success of my strategy from a world where I'm trying to come in and grow up my fitness, but everything else is playing a very, is, is a very virulent strategy. So if every other pathogen in the population is killing their host in picoseconds, or every other pathogen in the population is letting their host live forever, maybe that shapes the success of what I do. How would you analyze that? How would you think about that? Are there, uh, does this sound familiar to anything else? Exactly, it's, it's essentially game theory, right? So you're, but what's required for that to happen is that there has to be something about your fitness that is frequency or density dependent, right? And it has to be the fact that your fitness depends on something that the others in the population are doing, um, which is not the case in this relationship, right? But uh, just to illustrate one of the useful heuristics people have deployed in this area, um, a, a framing called adaptive dynamics, have you come across this before? Is sometimes used where what you do is you plot out the virulence of every possible resident strategy. So you say the population exists, every single individual pathogen in the population is playing this game, then how successful is every possible invading strategy? Right? And so obviously when they're equal on the x equals y line, they have the same fitness, but it's what happens around that that's interesting. And so for example, with that simple example I gave you, what it looks like is this. So the white areas are areas where the invader cannot invade, the red areas are where it can invade. And you'll see, so for example, what I, what I did to get this graph was I said, okay, the, the, uh, the uh, resident has a virulence of 0 0.01. Can the invader invade if it has a virulence of 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, et cetera? And I just filled in this graph that way. And what you can read off this figure immediately is that there is a strategy that cannot be invaded, right? This vertical line is always in the yellow but can invade everybody else. The horizontal line is always in the red. And this is thus a convergent stable strategy. Whatever happens, we expect this guy to win, 
right? Because if a mutation, if you're in this world where this population is resident and a mutation pops up that has a slightly higher virulence, then it will go to fixation. Even higher virulence will go to fixation. Higher virulence will not go to fixation, will be selected again. So you move back here, you end up circling this point. More interesting things can happen the moment you have frequency or density dependence. And so, for example, this is where you might get, you know, this is our convergence stable strategy, as I just described. But there are situations where there is a strategy that uh, can not invade everybody, but, but, but can be, that can invade everybody, but can also be invaded by everybody. So you end up with super funky dynamics. Or you might end up with situations where you're at an evolutionary branching point, which you might, uh, one way I've heard it uh, described beautifully, so the con concept behind this, is it's like there's a fitness peak and everybody's running up the fitness hill and then it collapses under their weight. So you end up getting an evolution away from that and evolutionary branching going on. And that's captured by this picture, essentially. Because uh, it's just such a happy place. <laughs> and you can see there's a snake and then there's an apple here. <laughs> no, I, so it's because, so, <laughs> um, so you, uh, I, I don't know, I'd have to look that up. Let me look that up and come back to you. One of the things that people like to obsess about in the context of the effects of vaccination is whether imperfect vaccines that don't prevent transmission could actually make virulence worse, right? So how would this work? Anyone have an idea? So this would be vaccines, and an example is the whooping cough vaccine. Another example is the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. They stop you from getting sick, but they don't stop you from transmitting. And if we think there's a relationship between transmission and virulence, but what vaccination is doing is just allowing you to live longer, what's gonna happen in terms of selection on the pathogen? Well, uh, the pathogen will only be selected by its capacity to reproduce, not any longer, uh, not any longer, w w w it w the effect it has on the organism will, will matter to its evolution. So uh, you'd, you'd go to a, to a scenario where either characteristics would flow within, in a neutral way or uh, there will be some mutation relating to replication which will, uh, which will fixate, uh, not due to randomness, but due to being better at replicating than the others. So I don't know. This is a great answer. So I think you're, in a way you're like several steps ahead of the field. Because <laughs> the way people have thought about it for a long time is that you have a relationship between virulence and transmission, right? And that what we're saying is that the vaccine just moves the virulence down, but it doesn't change the, the, the relationship. It just means that in people who've been vaccinated, some toxin is blocked. And what that means is that the, the, what the people have, one of the ways people have conceptualized this is that means that the pathogen can afford to have higher transmission, can evolve towards higher transmission, because it's not paying the cost of killing you. And that means you could get evolution of more virulent pathogens that wouldn't manifest in anyone who's been vaccinated, but might manifest in people who hadn't been. But the, um, uh, this was a paper that was first written in 2004. And the contemporary perspective on that is sort of essentially exactly what you said, which is that the details of the mechanism, how this is happening, you know, what do you mean by toxin blocking? What is the relationship and how does vaccination change it? Are very important in trying to understand this process. But if we still are moving in this world, we might be in a world where unvaccinated hosts will experience extremely high virulence as a result of evolution of the pathogen towards higher transmission, which comes along with higher virulence for which they're not paying the price in the vaccinated hosts. And as I mentioned before, there is this, is, there is this perception that people just love making stuff up around this because it's super fascinating and fun, uh, but there's not a lot of strong empirical evidence underneath it. There is one exception to this, and this is some work on a disease of chickens. These are very happy looking chickens, but most chickens, at least in places that Benny and I live, are raised in you know, horrific factory farm conditions, which really promote the transmission of infections. 
And one of these infections is Marek's disease. And Marek's disease um, is exactly the kind of thing where the vaccine blocks, stops the chickens from getting sick, but does not stop the virus from transmitting. So it's a really strong candidate for showing this problem. And people went and looked at a bunch of different strains of Marek's disease that were historically, these are the oldest and this is the most recent strain. And what you're seeing is the percent alive as a function of time in, in vaccinated hosts, so they're pretty much all surviving, and in unvaccinated hosts. And you can see that they're dying faster and faster and faster. And they keep, one of the reasons we see these strains is they keep updating the vaccines because the vaccines start to fail. The vaccines are suddenly no longer completely protective. Um, so what we're seeing is that the, there is this gradient of virulence that has occurred is that enough to conclude that this is the signature of selection? No, it's not, right? You'd like to know a few more things. And so what they did was they looked at the amount of virus that was shed by these chickens in days post-infection, and that's shown in these different lines. And in that like, not-so-virulent one, you're actually getting more virus shed in the vaccinated chickens than the unvaccinated. Um, and they're living quite a long time, right? So you, this is the situation where virulence is not dominating, but here, Suddenly, you know, the, these, these, these vaccinated chickens, these unvaccinated chickens are dying super fast, and the vaccinated chickens that have more, um, have less, less chance of dying are also shedding more virus. And if you look at the cumulative, what you're seeing is that as you move from this least virulent strain to the most virulent strain in the vaccinated hosts, it has an increased fitness. So it's, it's a winning strategy for this Marix disease to evolve towards killing a chicken in a heartbeat, right? Like this chicken is going so, so fast if it's unvaccinated because you're getting this bonus in the vaccinated chickens. Um, and there's, they did a lot of other things uh, as they pulled this evidence together. So they looked at time courses, they looked at other pieces. So this is something that can happen. Of course, will depend on the pattern uh, of the mechanisms within hosts, but it's certainly something to keep an eye on as we move through the world. Now, especially for Thales and Kawe, I'm now going to talk briefly about modeling virulence in plants, <laughs> uh, which is an interesting question if you, for many reasons, obviously. And I have a wonderful postgraduate uh, student who works in the Rocky Mountains on this little flower here. Um, this is Ian. Uh, and it's called flax. Oh, Kawe's like <laughs> <laughs> And the pathogen is a fungus, so it's flax rust. And it looks like this on the plant. So it's these little orange pustules that kind of grow on the plant. And the more orange pustules there are, the worse it is for the plant, obviously. And we've been living in a world where we have been working uh, as if you know, you're either susceptible or you're infected. There's no sort of variable way of being infected, right? Like it's, you're either it or not, it's zero or one. Um, but obviously, this suggests that there's like a variable range of burden in, in these plants. And so to model this, the first thing we did was we moved into a discrete time framework for reasons that will become obvious. Does anyone, this is pretty, this is again a very easy question for you guys, but how would we write down a discrete time model? Let's do a susceptible infected model so they never recover from infection. call it a fertility perhaps right so the number of babies but it's also going to be babies from infected individuals yeah and then we want to take them away in the usual way so we'll do some sort of uh, force of infection and since we are in we're suddenly no longer in the continuous time world we want to move from the rate to a probability so if beta i is the rate at which susceptibles become infected also known as the force of infection the uh, probability that a susceptible individual becomes infected will be 1 minus exponential minus beta i. Yes, this is the classic rate to probability transform. Let's call this phi. So minus phi st. And that means that i t plus 1. Oh, and I forgot something. 
Let's assume, yeah, nobody's, nobody's dying. That's not great, right? We need, we need well, plants. We need plants to die. Uh, and we're going to put it here. We're going to do, let's say, let's do survival of plants, a little s. So I'm assuming something about the relative ordering, right? You need to survive in order to be infected in the way this is expressed. It plus one is going to be, oh, guys, you're not helping me. One minus five, right? <laughs> So the ones who are staying susceptible are the ones who are not getting infected, yeah? And the ones who are getting infected are the susceptibles who've survived, become infected, and then moved into the infected class. And then there's going to be some kind of uh, death on the infected. And let us assume that it's the same basic parameter as the susceptibles, but maybe it's amplified by alpha. Right, so this is going to be a number that's bigger than one, for example. All right, back to the slides. This is what that looks like. But what we, you know, and the usual pieces are in play. What we, and one of the things you can do pretty straightforwardly, I'm sure very obviously to you, is frame this as a matrix, right? So we have S and I in a vector. We multiply it by a matrix that looks like this uh, to get NT plus one, right? And this is, so to go from S to S, you need to have babies and survive and not get infected. To go from S to I, you get infected. There's an S missing there. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, to go from I to S, the only way to do it is to have babies. And um, this, is, this should be, you need to survive and not die as a, as a right. OK, but we're missing this core biological element, which I raised. So if you can write down a little schematic, what you can see is that what probably matters is how many of these postules the plants are experiencing. The magnitude of this fungal burden, and Ian has evidence that it does, could shape survival, could shape mortality, could, and obviously shapes transmission. The more of this yellow stuff there is on the leaves, the more spreads through the populations. Um, and we can write down relationships. We go out into the fields, and we have done this. We can get at what these distributions Ma look like, right? So Sorry. you can, yeah? Magnitude of, of fungal burden is how much of it there is on top of the yes. leaves in each plant. That is, a, I mean, you could define it many ways. This is the thing that we could most easily measure, <laughs> uh, which may or may not be the perfect thing, but it's the one we could get at. Because um, this, I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, this example, maybe by contrast to the, uh, the very uh, um, detached from reality example of modeling evolution of virulence, is one that is very inspired by how close you can get to the data. And in particular, one of the things we can do with the data we have, which is that Ian went out and measured plants and measured how many orange pustules there were on each leaf, estimated, I think, in most cases, measured some and estimated in others, um, is you can see how that grows from time step to time step. So that's this relationship here. This is parasite load at t and parasite load at t plus 1. And you can fit it with a pretty simple linear regression. Um, you can also fit, figure out when a plant is initially infected what its burden looks like, so some sort of density function. And then obviously these plants are going to be dying at some rate as a function of burden. And so I've, showed, I've, made, I've made up some relationships there. But you know, again, you could fit this pretty easily with a logistic regression. If you have repeated data, repeated measurements on these plants, you can directly turn them into statistics. That way. I, uh, sorry, it was <laughs> too loud. Uh, why, I didn't get yet why you, you needed to Go from the continuous time model to the the discrete, the discrete time model so in this case. Just is it a seasonal plant and, and you have very well defined uh, reproduction time or, or something like this? So that's a great question. Um, I think the reason uh, so you certainly could do continuous time. The reason I went to discrete time here is because we're doing this empirical mapping that is somehow very straightforward. We went out and remeasured the plants every couple of weeks. So we had a discrete time step, right? And we're trying to make our model look close to the data. Um, and this particular framing I'm going to show you is one that lends itself to the discrete time framing. But it could be, can, it, it, you know, you guys know, it's pretty easy to move between the two, depending on what you're going to do. And what you can do is add a continuous process to this discrete time piece, right? So we can, and you might add other covariates such as climate, which I've shown here. So, so the number of susceptibles at t plus 1 might be survival, which could depend on climate, time susceptibles, 1 minus phi t, um, plus fertility. But now our infecteds are defined across a gradient of burden. So z is this burden piece. So there is within our 
discrete formulation, we now have this continuum of ways plants can be, that we are expressing using density functions, etc., all the machinery of statistics we can apply to our data in the field. Um, and so the relationships that we need to get at this are we need to know that distribution of the burden when a plant is first infected, and we need to know how the burden changes through time, which I've described using this G function. Uh, and so that initial parasite load, pretty straightforward. You have some mead and some variance. This distribution is going to be, uh, if you imagine you know, the way regression works, you're effectively, you always think of it as an intersect and a slope, but there is, of course, a density function around every point on the intercept and the slope. And so what I'm saying is, if you start off here, there's a certain probability you're going to end up with a slightly higher burden. There might be a, a bigger, uh, the greatest probability you end up here, and a very small probability you end up here. Right? So I'm going to be distributing the future of infected plants in terms of their burden according to what my regression tells me they should be. Does that make sense? So you're t and, and I think the beauty of this here is that you're taking the empirical data and you're walking it straight into your model. And you're doing it just very crisply with the statistical relationships that we have to hand. Of course, you're thinking like, this is very nicely drawn, and well, it's not very nicely drawn, but this is drawn at any rate. Um, but how does that actually work? Uh, and so the relationship might look like Something like this, just conceptually, right? I still have the S box and the I box, but the I box has this vast uh, set of subcategories within it. And if you start off in the S box, you recruit into the I box with some sort of distribution, right? So that we know that there's a starting distribution here, and then you grow over time. These are that starting probability density function. This is that regression. And what you have is you solve it numerically by just building a grid and using the midpoint rule to figure out what those density transitions actually look like. Okay? Yes. In the integral you had before, the, the Z, in the integral you had before, the, the Z variable was a phenotype variable relating to the like, size of the plant, something like this, and you were distributing across this phenotype the population of infect. I didn't get it. Yes, was it? Fantastic insight, right? So you could use anything, right? It could oh, be, okay. classically people have used these to model size of the plant itself. <laughs> Uh, which you could do, you could do, you could have a two-way classification where you had size of the plant and size of the burden. I'm using it to characterize the burden and the growth of the burden, but there is no limits on what you could do. So people have used this essential framework to model uh, the dynamics of sheep, the dynamics of plants, you know, without thinking about infections at all. This, the, the, but it's obviously straightforward to extend it to thinking about infections. And if you, once you do this, you know, once you start throwing in these crazy mechanisms, you can get all sorts of wild things. So this is just a sort of toy example. But we did a simulation where we assumed that temperature is increasing. And as temperature increases, you can say, so for example, that survival declines with temperature, but it also declines with burden. And so that means that the total population first goes down really quickly, because the plants are dying faster and faster because it's getting hotter and hotter. But suddenly, the infected plants are there no more, because they're all dead. <laughs> So the number of susceptible plants starts recovering, and the total population starts recovering. Just to make the point that the outcome of things like climate forces in these situations where you have these feedbacks is obviously quite, uh, quite contingent and dependent and hard to intuit. And bringing that combination of actual empirical data with a model that captures what's going on is probably quite important to figuring out uh, what the future will be. I think plant pathogens are obviously, this is not uh, obviously a pathogen of vast agricultural concern, but flax is a agriculturally used host, so there's many applied reasons you might think that this was relevant. No one working on applied populations uh, does this kind of thing because, so it was working on agricultural populations because you know you just go out and get rid of that crop or whatever it is, you don't sort of try and figure out what's going on. So there's very little I think that we understand yet about how plant pathogens are spreading, how climate shapes their dynamics. So it's a huge area demi demanding clever young minds to, to come and solve it. OK. So just in the last bit, you might have been wondering as we move forwards, I showed you that it could happen. I speculated that it might happen. We know that SARS-CoV-2 exactly has a vaccine that reduces virulence but does not really affect transmission. So what can we say about the future? This is some work 
that, again, Ian also did, Ian who works on plants and people, um, which is to sort of try and think through, this was in 2021, how we might expect things to happen. And this is obviously kind of a burning question at the time. Uh, just a reminder of how SARS-CoV-2 works, I know all of you know. Binds ACE2, it enters cells, starts to replicate. You get worse symptoms with replication lower in the lungs, but immunity also drives many of the symptoms. The thing that kills us is generally our immune systems. Um, and again, this is also to illustrate that the biological details really matter when thinking about how these things manifest in the real world. So if we want to think about the variants of concern, which is what we were doing at the moment, to recapitulate what we had earlier, we care about increased trans transmissibility. We care about whether it can overcome natural vaccinal immunity. It's obvious that it can. Uh, and we care about increased virulence, which alone never increases the fitness of a pathogen. And this I've showed you before, but you might be asking, OK, so is this even relevant to SARS-CoV-2, since we know that in many cases, mortality is actually occurring after the infection? So is it really shortening that period of transmission? Well, there's a host of different ways in which virulence might be, push, be pushing around that length of duration. It doesn't need to actually kill you and remove you from the population entirely. Behavior changes might matter, right? If you're feeling unwell, you might go home and not be part of the transmission. Um, you might be in hospital and in a super spreader event in the hospital, right? There's many ways it could happen. But there, when it is easy to imagine situations where just illness itself reduces the duration of transmission without thinking about death. An important consideration, though, if we try and map this sort of model framing to the world. So not impossible to imagine we might have something like this. But to observe something like this, we need to know that evolution of increased transmission is even possible. This was not obvious until Christmas 2020, when Alpha entered the scene. Right? We didn't know that you could have more virulent, more, sorry, more transmissible variants in the population. Um, and we also need to know that increased transmission is linked to increased virulence. So the first is certainly true, but the second is ambiguous. It was certainly the case for alpha. I think the evidence is pretty strong that alpha was more virulent, so it made people more sick than the ancestral strain. And possibly delta, it's a little bit more ambiguous. But of course, Omicron, if anything, seems to be milder. Although, it's, again, it's actually very hard to figure out how bad Omicron was, given that it was spreading on a background of populations that were immune. So comparison to what baseline is the question. Um, so possible, but certainly not knocking it out of the park. And another thing is, you know, when you draw these trade-off curves, you're kind of assuming that the pathogen is sitting right on the, on the most transmissible it can be. There's nothing to assume that's the case for SARS-CoV-2, right? It might be still within these trade-off curves, moving towards the edges of it. So we don't know whether it's reached the limits of what it can do, whether it's bounded by the, these limits in any way. Still, um, you know, since the, although every, nothing said that it wasn't possible that it might happen, uh, Ian wished to explore how it could happen, and he wished to explore it particularly in the context of vaccination. And this was because the work happened at a time where vaccines were being ramped up all over the world, but vaccine inequity was just really startling, right? So I told you the chickens that weren't vaccinated died at enormous rates. It would be awful. It would be like another layer of awful if sub-Saharan Africa suffered because of the ways in which vaccine hoarding had actually increased protection. I mean, just like a, a double level of dreadful. OK, so what can we think about in this case? Same sort of process. We believe that the vaccine is uh, Re reducing the time that you're transmitting, but it might not be reducing transmission per se. And we know that there's this global inequity in vaccination. Ian built a pretty simple model to tackle this, where he broke apart. You can think of the, um, the way SARS-CoV-2 works as being maximizing transmission if it's in the higher lungs and maximizing virulence if it's in the lower lungs, right? It's, it's a lower lung infection that tends to really take you out. But it could be any two compartments. And he's sort of based basically constructed a pretty simple model that had a degree to which your vaccine stopped the upper respiratory tract transmission and infection versus the lower. And you can make an argument based on trials we'd seen in chimpanzees and how that worked and uh, what we knew about T cell immunity. So you can sort of nest some of this in, in the processes of immunity at play. 
And I mean, what you find is nothing that is, uh, that is too striking. So this is upper respiratory tract infection versus lower respiratory tract infection. This is the degree to which the vaccine protects against transmission. And this is how much it protects against uh, virulence. And so if you increase lower respiratory tract protection, you expect selection for increasing virulence. Um, assuming, again, absolutely assuming that there is a relationship between virulence and transmission, which we do not know to be the case. But we're exploring the kind of worst case scenario. And in the worst case scenario that this relationship exists, absolutely, uh, the more, the better your vaccine is at protecting you, but not stopping you from transmitting, the greater the selection for a more virulent pathogen. So the red are more virulent pathogens. And these are actually hypervirulent. We don't know, but we just don't know. An unbounded selection for increased virulence is possible, an intermediate optimal is possible, or we could be vaccinating so much that we reduce the opportunity for this happening, because vaccination does reduce transmission to some degree. Of course, what we'd really like to do is know what's happening. It would be much more powerful if we had a sense of what the profile of virulence was in the population. Um, we know that more circulation globally means more opportunity to, for variants to emerge. This is you know, a ship that has kind of sailed. Um, and we know that it's actually going to be extremely hard, because we've failed so many times, to suggest the conditions that are most propitious for particular variants to spread. But it would be really good to have a sense of infection fatality ratios, and also infection fatality ratios that tracked what individuals' immune status was. Right? People have had different vaccines, they've had different infections. All of these things shape what, how much they survive, let alone the variants itself. So, uh, having a better understanding of this is going to be, I think, essential to trying to understand what that future is. And then, you know, the, and this is something, brings up something Kawe was saying, which is that the details, the mechanistic details of how this is happening, how virulence is manifesting, how transmission is manifesting, actually something that you said as well, like what does, why would that relationship look the way it does, is something that we can potentially get to grips with by developing clinical studies of within-host viral evolution. And you can build, again, mathematical models of what's going on with all these moving parts that's happening inside the body, this is something that I have done, um, but you need vast amounts of data to do it, and probably animal models as well. Okay, so I'm gonna say uh, one more thing in this thread, and then we'll move into a break, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about evolution, uh, about how an evolutionary perspective can shape our understanding of pathogens. And this is the evolution of resistance to therapeutics. So this is drugs, so for example, many malaria, drugs, we've rapidly seen evolution of resistance. Um, if we think about the, the ways in which this might manifest at the scale of genomes, right? So this is a position along a genome, and this is genetic diversity at that particular location. So at a particular location in me, you guys, if we sort of took this entire class and plotted how diverse we were at one location in the genome, what this is saying is that it's pretty consistently like 0.8 in many populations. However, as you move a little further along this gene, you get this cratering effect, okay? And then the genetic diversity recovers. This is just, again, a position along a chromosome, along a set of genes. And if you go looking at what's going on, what you find is that what's sitting in the middle at the heart of this distribution is a mutation that confers drug resistance to a malaria drug. So what's going on? Why would this be? Why would you expect this pattern? David. Yeah. Can you explain well? Can you hear me there? Uh, I think yes. it's not going to uh, <laughs> Because this is not working, so maybe I'll do it now. Um, I think that the mutation gels uh, are um, like what. What I know about recombination is that you have uh, hot spots where the recombination happens a lot, uh, really fast, and you have a mutation rate uh, that can give you uh, more like chances to have these mutations and get the drug resistance. So the selection are going to maintain this because it's increasing the fitness of this specific pattern. So you can just have these genes, these positions that confers you the way to to resist the drug. <laughs> I don't know. So that's a great point. So we certainly expect, you know, mutations going to play into this. But what's interesting here is that we're actually seeing less genetic diversity right around where the mutation is. And maybe we should say what recombination is for the physicists in the room. Ben? <laughs> Sorry. 
Sorry, Ben. It's important to note that malaria parasites have chromosomes, they're eukaryotic, and they sexually recombine, similar to how humans do. And if you have a chromosome, you don't inherit the chromosome exactly as it was in your grandparents. As eggs and sperm are being reproduced, meiosis is happening, the chromosomes all line up, they stack on top of each other, they connect, and then they recombine, they swap. So it's sort of swapping different fragments of the chromosome as meiosis is occurring. Do the physicists follow? Oh, yeah. So it's important to note that in the malaria parasite, you have this recombination happening. And heterozygosity is the measure they're using as sort of like a measure. Homozygosity is the opposite of heterozygosity. So why does genetic diversity disappear around the position in the genome that encodes resistance to, in this case, chloroquine? Explain how? Because if you're a malaria parasite with this gene, you're going to have more babies because you're going to <laughs> <laughs> resist to the drug. That's it. Uh, so uh, this is correct, but I'm not sure the intuition necessarily follows for everybody. So if you have this gene, you're going to have more babies. That makes sense to everybody? Sorry? You're going to die, so you're going to have babies. I, I mean, I completely agree. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, because you're, you're resisting the drugs which are present in the population. And so what does that mean? That means that your offspring are at greater and greater frequency of the population, which means that there's less and less diversity right around this piece, right? And there's often a little bit that's carried along with it because the, the genes aren't broken up completely by recombination. Uh, so exactly right. We all know malaria parasites have babies. So I'll I'll go again. Sorry, Root. Uh, <laughs> uh, the well. The, the plasmodium does meiosis, and then uh, you get double the, the number of cells, and then they, s they recombine amongst the population that is locally there, and, and that's it. That's what, because. Yeah, so malaria parasites are proper organisms. They sexually recombine and things like that. But how it happens in particular is they're haploid and asexual as they're replicating in the human bloodstream, and there's millions and billions of cells produced. And then when they're taken by a mosquito and they go into the mosquito stomach, some of them will differentiate towards males, they call them microgametes, and some will differentiate towards what we can think of as females, they call macrogametes, and then they find each other and the males actually break out of the cell and go swim through the mosquito stomach to go find a female. And then those two haploid, it's like sperm and egg, they fertilize and then they're diploid momentarily and then they divide again and go back to being haploid, a haploid. Yeah, that's cool. And so if there wasn't any recombination, there would be no valley because all the, for the entire chromosome, all the genetic diversity would be eliminated because only that chromosome, that individual that had the chromosome with that mutation would take over the whole population. Because there's recombination, that specific mutation or allele that confers resistance can spread, but the things farther away from it get attached to different allelic combinations. And so we say that these mutations that are near the one, the important one that causes resistance, hitchhike and they follow that mutation across the population. Okay, so take a, a, let's take a five minute break. Let's come back at 35 and then we'll do a little bit more.
Hello. Uh, there's one of you. Uh huh. You want to see the previous slides, or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I was about to close this. Yes. Uh, just on this part that you talk about, let me see, I wrote the, the title. Aging protests or toxic blocks? Vaccines that do not prevent I understand this part that pathogen can select for higher transmissions and vaccinate to hosts things they won't pay the price. I don't know if I I think I, I think I also confused Kave. So <laughs> so we, we are assuming that you know there is a relationship between virulence and transmission, right? Let's do transmission here and virulence here, right? This is the, the assumption. And we're saying that if you vaccinate the hosts you push down the virulence. Maybe, so for example, for the tetanus vaccine, the vaccine actually stops the toxin, like stops this toxin, which seems to be um, a, the, the main thing that kills us. So the virulence falls to a lower level, but we're assuming that there's still a, this relationship overall is still there. So maybe actually it would have been better to do it the other way around. In this case, when you say virulence, it's about the amount of toxins Again, this is this, um, you know, the, the one could think of it that way, yes. And, and, but it is, a, you know, it's a fuzzy concept because it's very much about people writing down like a, the emergent property is how much it kills the host and so then trying to map it to the biology is a bit messy. So, for example, depending on the virus or the type of disease, you could attribute uh, different ideas for this virus. Like Absolutely. And there is some concern that, you know, that this is not necessarily the most realistic mapping for any system. It seems to work well for the Marix disease system, but there are, there are questions. Great question, though. I'm, I'm going to get better at explaining that. <laughs> Thank you. So that, it doesn't feel like a very unified.
All right, everybody, uh, we're back. Um, a, little, a little refreshing, last 20 minutes before lunch. And we're going to talk about the thing that, of course, none of us has escaped. In late 2019, a coronavirus spilled over from a natural population and spread around the world in these peaks and troughs that changed all of our lives in ways that were mostly not great. And it is, of course, uh, the efforts of people around the world, people like you, that gave us estimates of the core parameters of this infection, the R0, the incubation period, the infection fatality rate, that were essential for understanding what we were dealing with. Um, and I think it was extremely heartening how hard so many people, so many people like you, around the world worked to get to grips with these numbers and allowed us to plan, allowed us to try and anticipate. However, as part of, in the storm of all of this, uh, Ben and I were chatting about the, you know, the, this thing that had come into our world and that had made our world so strange and so different. And Ben asked what was a really simple question, but I think a really uh, intuitive, sort of insightful question, which is why are there only four endemic coronaviruses? Like some of you may not know this, but there are four species of coronaviruses that circulate in human populations. They're like common colds, they happen every winter if you live in a hemisphere that has strong seasons, but there are only four of them. And this is kind of weird because we've had a lot of emerging and re-emerging infections over the past history. So this is a whole bunch of different ones, but if you narrow in on just the coronaviruses, we had in 2003 SARS-CoV, in 2014 MERS-CoV, and then obviously in 2019 SARS-CoV-2. This is three, three over the last 20 years. If you extrapolated this rate backwards, if you thought it was happening in the same way, we should have at least 15, right? Even just going back 100 years. Why do we only have four? And you can think through the reasons that that might be. And one of them might just be that we're bad at counting, right? It could be that we think it's four. It's actually a much bigger number. This is where mathematical modeling comes to play again. We can actually use a result which is the species accumulation curves. This is the number of species we know exist amongst the viruses over time. And obviously, as time passes, you discover more and more, but that curve starts to saturate at some stage. And that is what's happened here. So it's pretty unlikely that we're missing a huge number of coronavirus species, right? It seems, you know, that it's not impossible, but it seems quite unlikely because this curve is saturated. And another reason that it seems unlikely, and again using some really basic mathematical intuition, is you'd expect that it would be really hard to detect rare emergent pathogens if they're flashing into the population and disappearing, and yet we've seen three. So it seems like the number of endemics actually must be much smaller than the number of emergent pathogens because of our ability to see them. Okay, so let's assume that we're counting them right, that it is only four. What else could be happening? It could be, we're assuming in the simple analogy that the rate of spillover was the same over the last 100 years. Maybe it's got faster. This is not implausible. We live in a world where disruption, anthropogenic disruption to natural systems has amplified. And this, we know, can lead to greater contact between humans and zoonotic reservoirs. It can increase spillover. However, this isn't a new phenomenon. We know that zoonotic spillover has been happening since the plague of Athens. We can't entirely dismiss the possibility that it's pretty much the same as it ever was. And of course, another side of this is maybe anthropogenic disruption is certainly happening, but travel is also increasing dramatically. So this is the airline flows in 1933. In 2020, of course, it looks like this. So something could spill over somewhere and could get everywhere. However, you know, 1918 flu was well before this and it got, sorry, yeah, well before this and got all the way around the world. So it's not an absolute barrier, right? So it's still, again, this could be a contributing factor, but it seems unlikely that this is the only piece in play. Have we changed? Is there something about us that is different from what it used to be? We've got older, not you guys, obviously, <laughs> but the rest of us are super old. Me and Ben, just <laughs> decrepit. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ben. <laughs> uh, and it, it's, it's well known that 
older individuals have less functioning immune systems, right? Our immune memory has depleted. We have less capacity to respond to new antigens. We might be more fertile ground for emergent pathogens as a global population now than we were. But again, there's reason to think that this can't be the whole explanation. And that reason is that the people who are most likely to contact the zoonotic reservoirs are probably mostly quite young, right? The people who go out and hunt bats are more like your age than our age, my age, our age. <laughs> so, so again, could be a piece of the puzzle, probably not the whole of the puzzle. People have argued that there's limits to pathogen biology, right? So we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. Maybe it's really hard for coronaviruses to find the right mapping to the right human receptor to allow them to spread within human hosts. It seems very unlikely because coronaviruses are extremely diverse. There's thousands of species in both avian and mammalian hosts. We see them all over the place. Furthermore, if you look at the, path, the coronaviruses that infect humans, so these are shown in red here, they are, and sorry, in yellow are the endemics and in red are the emergence, they come from all over the show. They come from rodents, they come from bats, they come from camels, they come from raccoon dogs. It doesn't seem like they're restricted to one particular species. They seem to be pretty good at moving between species. They use different receptors. So ACE2 is not the only receptor that the coronaviruses use. Um, ACE2 is one, but DPP4 is one, and this other one as well. So they're clearly you know, not restricted to a particular receptor. And furthermore, as happened early on during the pandemic, there's been huge amounts of spillback. Zoo populations have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, and ferrets and uh, gorillas and cats, even like a mountain lion, I think. No, it was, a, it was a snow leopard got coronavirus. So they're clearly, they're not stuck to a species. They seem to be able to get around fine. So the limits to pathogen biology argument seems tricky. Doesn't seem like that can be the whole explanation. And furthermore, if you think, but, but there is one way in which it might be hard for these things to get around it, which is that it might be hard for them not to kill us super quickly, right? They might get out of the zoonotic reservoir into a host, but then this virulence transmission, they might just kill us so quickly that they never get anywhere else. Um, and so it might be hard for exactly these coronaviruses to achieve the right balance of virulence and transmission. Again, a mathy way of thinking through how these things might be restricted. Um, possible. We know it can happen, however. We've seen many coronaviruses come over, and uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 have spread successfully. Worth keeping in mind, though. It could be that host immunity is, a, is an important limiting factor. So this is uh, something that's very interesting, is that many, coronavirus, many emergent pathogens evolve to look more like their hosts. Um, and it could be that the ones that spill over just you know, got unlucky and look mostly like something that our immune system sees very easily. So for example, something weird about primates is that we have a very high ratio of Cs followed by Gs in our genomes. This is because of patterns of methylation. And so therefore, what part of our immune system goes looking exactly for low levels of Cs followed by Gs, because that's a good indicator that you're not part of me, that you're part of a pathogen, and you get zapped. Um, the MERS coronavirus, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that has not spread very far, seems to have come in with a really high CPG ratio. So it could be that it's just tricky for them to sort of, you know, thread the needle of all the ways in which we are set up to recognize things. On the other hand, some of them do it. So that, you know, doesn't seem, again, like the whole explanation. The other side of the coin is, of course, adaptive immunity. And there certainly seems to be cross-adaptive immunity between the different coronaviruses. This is data that Ben and I were staring at in the early 2020 from Scotland, looking at four, three of the different endemic coronaviruses. And what you see is that when the orange coronavirus, which is 229E, is high, the purple one is small. And if you fit a mathematical model to this, which you can do, you can see evidence of cross-reactivity. So when one spreads through the population very fast, it seems to be protective against the other. And this, obviously, you know, if, they, if they're stopping each other from spreading, Maybe they're also stopping things that are spilling in from going anywhere else. And you can conceptualize this using a bit of a map, right? You might think there's four in here in this kind of adaptive immunity space. And wherever they sit, they create a shadow around them, which the endemic spillovers can't get into. Um, and so there maybe just isn't that much space. And so it's probably a little bit of everything, right? Everything is a little bit of everything. But I think this is the thing that we find the most intriguing and the most interesting. And also, it's one that is absolutely measurable as we go forwards. 
this surprising mismatch, I think, gives us a starting point for trying to think about how these emergent pathogens come through. Just thinking about the fact that four is a small number opens the way that there must be something, there must be something about the biology that includes these, four, these three processes that, that have to happen, that have to happen for a pathogen to emerge. And obviously, like, it is really important that we get to grips with what these limits are. You know, the next pandemic is coming, unfortunately. It would be great if we could slightly anticipate it. It would be great if we got a handle on what these barriers are to spillover happening or not. I've talked a little bit about the fact that SARS-CoV-2 has evolved greater transmissibility, greater immune to escape. We're not sure about severity, but absolutely thinking about this pattern of immune escape has got to be part of both thinking about future emergent pathogens, but also what we do with this one right now. And you can imagine, you know, that one of the really intriguing things that's been happening to date is that of the three massive variants, so this is Alpha, Delta, and Omicron, all of them came from a different evolutionary route. So this is a completely made-up figure, okay, just to say, absolutely made up. Uh, but what I'm showing you is different fitness peaks, right? So you can imagine, you can conceptualize this as them all coming off some root ancestor down here, and then Alpha climbed its fitness peak, Delta climbed a different fitness peak, Omicron climbed another one. We know that there are mutations that are shared across these different ones. There seems to be strong convergent evolution in the tools that these different variants use, and yet they are extremely different, and they've got there by different paths, which is quite fascinating. If you think back to what I described for, um, in the context of adaptive immunity, it's very easy to imagine that maybe the fitness landscape looked like this originally, but alphas peak cratered, right? There's no alpha with us anymore. Alpha spread in all the individuals it could, created immunity within them, and there's no more fitness for alpha. Uh, but what does this mean? Does this help us think about that spillover from the natural populations, from zoonotic reservoirs? Well, if we put these four endemic coronaviruses in the mix, maybe SARS-CoV-2 is a tiny corner over there. Maybe the fact that they're constraining each other means that we can also assume that what we've been seeing, this thing that has been turning our lives upside down, is actually a really small part of this conceptual mutational space for SARS-CoV-2. And in fact, there are hints of this, right? So there is a coronavirus that's been seen in cats that spilled over into a human, into a couple of humans, but it was impeded by immunity to 229E. Right? So people did the experiments, they looked at the immune profiles. If you'd been exposed to 229E, then this thing couldn't get in, which means we didn't have another coronavirus emergent pathogen which matters, right? So that's one line of evidence. And the other thing is that what we're seeing now for SARS-CoV-2, for Omicron in particular, is that instead of this vast jump to a whole new variant, it looks like Omicron is beginning to act more like influenza, where we have drifts, tiny changes rather than big jumps. That doesn't mean another big jump isn't coming, right? We've proven ourselves very bad at predicting the future for these things. But maybe one can hope that this space is filling up and that SARS-CoV-2 is going to sit in one of these corners, maybe it's going to drive one of the other coronaviruses extinct. That's a really interesting question. We don't know yet. We can start collecting data on it. And this is a slide you've all seen before. This is one of the reasons that I think a global immunological observatory, a sense of what this landscape of immunity looks like, could be a really powerful piece of how we grapple with both what emergent pathogen risks there are out there for us and what the current emergent pathogens are likely to do. So that was just a whistle-stop tour, and I hope uh, you can see through every bit how just thinking through the maths, the biology, virulence transmission, all these pieces can help us try and make sense of infectious diseases and emergent infectious diseases, which are clearly you know, one of the absolute frontiers of uh, bettering our lives today. So that's it. Thank you. We'll, we'll both be here for questions for the next 20 minutes. Oh, Gary. I, I didn't get very very well why there is a limiting in the the one where you have spheres in and they are uh, spheres? Yeah. yeah why would the can you can you rewind the explanation of uh, of this okay. Oh, um, <laughs> so, so, the, so, so this is, again, it's a conceptual model of what might be happening. We don't know what's happening for sure. What we do know is that if you, so that your immune system, if you had been exposed to one of the common coronaviruses, your immune system learns to recognize that. 
Um, these things have evolved away from each other, so they've evolved to look a little bit different, but they're still moving in a space where the shape is not totally different. So your immune system can protect you to some degree. There is cross-protection against immune coronaviruses. And so the idea that Ben and I ended up toying with was that because of this evidence for cross-protection, maybe there's a way in which the, you know, the range of space in which it's possible to be a coronavirus, it's possible to have that particular shape, um, is limited by what other coronaviruses are out there because all of the, your immune system knows everything about things that are in this space. So maybe there's space out here, but there's not space here because you and I, we've all seen this particular coronavirus. So if you dropped, if something dropped out of, and this, this was sort of illustrated by that cat coronavirus example, a coronavirus that's common in cats spilled over into human populations and it looked too much like 229E. So the 229E immune effectors shut it down so it couldn't spread. We're making stuff up, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, you're hypothesizing that there is a bounded uh, subset of the phenotype rates of all viruses where uh, a lineage which came from a coronavirus can get to and, and it couldn't get to all the points in such a space and, 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 that, and that place is uh, being it bounded and, and, and being it the tendency that the, the different strains will, uh, will occupy well, we'll tend to separate their niche. Now I'll use the word, the, the terrible word, the niche word. Uh, so, okay, I got it now. Okay. That, I think that's uh, but, exactly, but, but I think you phrase it really wonderfully, right? Which is that we, we don't know the ways in which the space is bounded. Uh, we, we, we are laying it out as a 2D surface because it helps to think about it. But absolutely all the ways in which we can better our understanding of how this space is bounded is surely going to help us. An example, perhaps, um, for thinking about Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, so this is the one that comes over from camels, um, it uses a receptor, DPP4, which is really, so it has this distribution in camel respiratory tracts, where it's very abundant in the upper respiratory tract and very less abundant in the lower respiratory tract. So this thing is a great infection of camels. Like, it spreads from camel to camel, it's very mild, the camels just spread it around, almost every camel is infected, no problem. If it gets into us, it turns out the same receptor has a distribution in, in us that is entirely different. But there's a lot of that receptor down at the bottom of our lungs. So it's very hard for this thing not to kill us. One way in which we could bound the ways in which the different receptors might be a, a, bound, a sort of a limit on the evolution of these different viruses is we could create a map of all these receptors, right? All the receptors that the viruses use across our lungs, and then we would know the ones that we need to worry about. And in a way, you know, the ones that kill us really quickly are not the most worrying. It's the ones that have some combination of distribution. I mean, they're worrying for the individual who dies, but they're not of concern for, for large spread within the population. So I think thinking, I mean, I think the way you framed it is perfect. We need to think about creative ways of thinking about all the 3D dimensions of this sort of space. This is all Ben's work, so Ben, if you want to add anything, you should just you should add stuff. <laughs> Only thing I would add is you could think of that uh, rectangle getting bigger, in which case there's more viruses entering the human population and they're farther and farther away. Or you could think of those circles getting smaller and taking up its equivalent that there's more free space. And so if we could understand how big that rectangle is, that's representing sort of like the possible confirmations that a viral protein can take or the length of the shadow of immunity to existing viruses then we could understand how much free space is available for a new pathogen to come in is just another way to rephrase what Jess already said and you know and I, the example I was using was about the virulence piece this is about immune escape all of these lenses presumably create a limited pool of viruses that can spill over into us We'd love to find them first, right? <laughs> I don't know that that's possible, but thinking about what that might be is uh, a useful way to go. Possib maybe. More questions? No? Lunchtime? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Sorry? <laughs> 